Hello and welcome to our feature match area for round 12 here at Grand Prix Prague. Tim Willoughby joined as ever by Matei Big Z Zadelkai and we mentioned players of the year. Jeremy Dezani of France, winner of Pro Tour Theros in Dublin the last time the Pro Tour made it to Th Dublin up against Brad Nelson. Jeremy Dezani kicking things off with a pacification array and we've already seen Dezani in the feature match area with this draft deck. We know that he is on red-green. Uh, what we don't know quite yet is what Brad ended up with in what was a pretty stacked draft pod. Well, great start for Jeremy though with a turn two voltaic brawl where while Brad only has uh, an implement of ferocity let's see if Brad can match him on his turn two interestingly enough this is the finals of uh, of their draft pod uh, which I think is draft pod number eight which also included uh, Martin News that we've seen earlier um, very very good sta very good pod including players with one loss and a draw like Brad Nelson but Jeremy Dezani had with the best tiebreakers out of all players at seven wins and two losses yesterday so he got to draft with the with the people at seven one and one metallic mimic the play there for Brad Nelson the mimic coming in as a two one it's gonna choose its own creature type when it comes into play and then as long as it's in play every creature of that type that Brad Nelson plays will come into play with a plus one plus one counter so if it can hang around and Brad has a deck that is pretty sort of single-minded about what it's doing creature types wise this could be a big creature on the board looks like Dazani is not <laughs> keen to find out exactly how good Jeez. it could be double voltaic brawler now the brawler on turn two is super powerful a second brawler I'm, I'm very very impressed with this start from Jeremy Dazani I think this game might not last too long throwing yeah. Rhino coming from Brad Nelson he does get some energy of his own but it might just be too little too late because yeah. these brawlers they're going to get stuck in, and there's now Pacification Array online to deal with the Thriving Rhino if Jeremy Dizani so chooses. Yeah, if, if there's a card that Brad Nelson would need, it's Maelstrom Pulse, but <laughs> it's not in this format. So has He's got the mana for it. Yeah, exactly, but uh, it's really hard to deal with. The turn, turn two and turn three will take brawlers. They're just relentless pressure, and Jeremy, uh, he did not play a, a four, fourth land, but has plenty of good cards in his hand. He even had the shock to deal with the Mimic. Animation module coming from Brad Nelson. That means that when counters go on uh, Thriving Rhino, he is going to be able to pay mana to make servos. And he can then sort of pseudo proliferate. Jeremy does allow the attack here. And I think that might be because he has an appetite for the unnatural in hand. So he's got the opportunity okay. to remove one of these artifacts in play, gain a couple of life. He's not too worried about what Brad Nelson's got going on here, though. Making an extra servo is it's a nice interaction. Yeah, but it doesn't do that much against... Uh like the, the trampling uh, brawlers. On the other hand, Jeremy only has one energy left, so he can't make both of them into 4-3s. So at least I think that's what Brad is now uh, hoping for. Looks like Brad might be considering using that Implement of Ferocity. It's going to cost just one green mana to sacrifice it to put a counter on one of his creatures. And that, of course, triggers the animation module exactly. once again. No, I like his deck. It's, it's pretty cute. Yeah, no, Jeremy's like, well, what, are, what, are you, what are you up to here? This isn't this isn't a neat combo. Yeah, if if Dazani was slow to deal with animation module initially, he may be rethinking that plan a little bit. It's one of those cards that it can take a bit of time to get working, but once it gets going, animation module, there's a reason it's the rare one of the module yeah. cycle. I wonder what the issue here is. He might be thinking about um if he cast the appetite for the unnatural to deal with the mm -hmm. servo, does Brad still get to draw the card? Sure. Yeah, so he was—he's still trying to respond. I think uh, yeah, the players have not communicated cl clearly here. I think what Jeremy has to decide—he he wants Brad to slow down a little bit when because uh, it's not clear which order the triggers are are uh, are happening, and so now he's going to destroy the servo in response to the counter being placed on it. So the animation module will not trigger. Exactly. So and uh, yeah. Uh, now Brad will be able to attack freely if he has some sort of generating energy. He can even finish the game off right away but even just putting Brad to one he can decide if he wants to put him on one or two but I would pr probably put him on two and I would save that energy for the next turn so I could give the one of the rollers a trample in case Brad plays two creatures or leaves the rhino bag and plays one yeah Dazani definitely a, just a colossal start for him so he's got mana up now such that he can use the pacification array to tap down Thriving Rhino if he so chooses. He's got the big creatures on the board and Brad says, you know what, let's go on to game two. I'm not winning this one. Yeah, Jeremy's deck is really good. Like we've seen uh, we've seen him uh, play against Martin Yuza and we saw some other good cards. Like he had the Servant of the Conduit and whatnot. 
his deck seems great. Yeah, d double Voltaic Tech Brawler, though. It'd be hard for him to ask for a better start than that one. Quickly picking up the first game, and we're going to get a chance to jump across to one of our other games now, see a little bit more magic while these two former players of the year each go to their sideboards and try and figure out what they want to be doing for game two. Mm. So here we see Kelvin Chu on the left of our screen up against Craig Wesco. Uh, always funny to see Wesco not playing white cards, but when it's limited, he's yeah. willing to branch out a little bit. He's already got Cultivator's Caravan in play there. He's got a plus one, plus one counter, and that is by virtue of the big green monster that you see in play there, that one being Ridgetail Tusker. I'm, I'm actually very uncomfortable seeing Craig play uh, a deck two times in a row that doesn't have any planes. It just doesn't, it doesn't feel right. I don't know about you. Well, Chu is not happy about this. This is a prey upon coming from Ridgegale Tusker to kill off his Ether Stream Leopard, leaving him with just the single Bandar in play. And while it is a powerful card, it's one that kind of needs friends before it really gets much going. Uh, there's a Silk Weaver Elite from Craig, uh, pl putting another creature in play. No revolt by the looks of things, but it's still a 2 2 reach. Uh, reach possibly not so relevant against a red green deck, but. He's happy to have more creatures on the battlefield. Yeah, I think Craig's going to be very happy about, about ne next turn potentially because he is playing white cards. I saw Don Feather Eagle in his hand, so he is playing white. Uh, I feel much more comfortable now. Is that a panharmonica in his hand as well? I think so. Yeah, that could be an interesting one. Certainly powerful with with, with the eagle. Right. <laughs> plus two, plus two in vigilance. Dub double vi vigilance. Oh, so vigilant. So vigilant. Just the most vigilant. So Kelvin Chu. He's got the lead in terms of life totals, but looking at the board here, it wouldn't surprise me if that turned around pretty quickly at this point. Let's see what Kelvin Drew can up with. I think I see two fours in his hand, so it's probably not, not very spicy. But he might, have, might be hiding something good there. I wonder what Craig's deck uh, does overall because I see an unbridled growth in his graveyard as well. So I assume he has some three color shenanigans going on. And that Panharmonicon, I mean, it's pretty sweet with the Tusker as well. <laughs> yeah, plenty of nifty things you can do with a Panharmonicon. Of course, you're effectively taking a turn off to cast it. But yeah. once it's in play, it does plenty. Yeah, I mean, he has uh, the Cultivate's Caravan with a plus one, plus one counter. Uh, so that can already attack as, as a 6-6. Six, six. I think he also drew a Servant of the Conduit. But he might have something better because he's tapping mana. He's going to go for the Eagle right away. Yeah, has to use the Caravan to get white mana. But that does mean that the rest of his team big enough to rumble on through. Scrounging Bandar not too potent a blocker in this case. And Kelvin Chu, look at that life total change there. Mm. Now on just three life and with a 3-3 three, three flyer in play, he's got to be a little bit concerned about how he's going to get back in this game. No trample at the moment for Wesco, but that pretty much the only shining light left for Kelvin Chu. Is that an island in his hand there? Has he got uh, a little bit of access to an additional color of mana that he maybe doesn't want uh, Wesco to know okay, about? Okay, now he, now he will know about it. Yeah, Imperial Voyager, and I think he has a Welding Sparks left in there, so I think he'll tr still try to put up a fight this game, even though I don't think he's going to be long for those worlds. We have heard that the other matches are just ready to go, so we're going to hold on for the, with this one for just a, a second. Let's see what we've got here. Embral Bruiser, the early play from Brad Nelson, Pacification Array, dealing with that one for now, and a Thriving Rhino, the follow-up from Brad Nelson, a much more solid start for mm. him, while Dazani having to wait a little bit before he gets his first creature on the battlefield, or indeed his second color. Yeah, so much different from yesterday, where some decks were starting with their first plays on turn three or four, and here the players have to get that two drop into play as soon as possible to keep up, and you can see Jeremy uh, using Pacification Area on turn two might be a good use for your mana, but you really would have uh, preferred to develop your board there. Etherstream left of the play on turn three, so the Pacification Array offline, at least for now. Uh, Brad doesn't yet have an artifact for his Embral Bruiser, so he's not going to be rumbling in with Menace unless he can find one on this turn. Yeah, but if he does, he's uh, going in for six damage, um, especially if he has a, a, has a decent artifact to the board. And uh, while Jeremy has the array, he, he the Aether Stream Leopard is much better at, at attacking uh, compared to blocking. One thing that is worth noting, quite a few gold cards in Jeremy Dazani's hand. Uh, he does have a lot of those kind of hallmark red-green gold cards. And we know from a lot of recent draft formats, the two-color gold uncommons tend to be a little bit pushed. Mm. No artifact from Brad, though, so 
he'll just be able to trade off the the uh, bruiser with the leopard here which i'm sure uh jeremy will be very happy about yeah small mercies there in terms of what brad's got going on no follow-up play for brad nelson Ooh. here what does that potentially signal? Yeah, that either Brad has nothing or he has some more expensive cards. I think I saw Rich Scale Tusker in his hand, uh, which is a great five drop, but like skipping your turn four is just gross. Yeah, not too many tricks that are going to need all four of that mana. Yeah. Uh, let's see what Jeremy can, uh, can muster here. I think I saw an Outland Boar in his hand, but I'm, I'm just wondering if he, if he has a fourth mana. He does. I think I saw a Territorial Gorger. Just the four mana two two gets plus two plus two whenever you cast. Uh, whenever you when gain energy. energy, yeah. Whenever you get one or more energy, being the important uh, templating there. Yeah, I think it would have been a little out of hand if you'd cast yeah. a Sage of Shayla's Claim and given your uh, territorial gorge plus six plus six. Yeah. That would be sweet. What are you talking about? It would make the card better than it is now. I th I think that we would be seeing a Gremlin deck in standard if <laughs> that were the case. <laughs> Probably, yeah. It's not too late. There's still time, guys. If you want to build that gremlin deck, you know, there's a bunch more gremlins in Aether Revolt. Yeah. All right. So Outland Boar is the choice. Uh, a pretty solid 4-4 four, for four. four. Uh, can't be blocked by creatures with power to or less than that. Not a big concern on this particular board. All of Brad Nelson's creatures have at least three power. And in fact, this Thriving Rhino going up to four power as it attacks here. 4-5. The numbers stack up very nicely against what Jeremy Dizani has going on. That another clean hit for Brad Nelson. Dizani does have lands and spells. He's, he was looking a little dicey on mana briefly, but it's, it's all coming back in line. Now it's a question of whether or not he wants to make plays that use all of that mana, or if he wants to hold some of it for Pacification Array. Mm. Let's see. Looks like there might be a precise strike in hand for Jeremy Dizani. That a nice little trick to balance out combat a little. Mm. <laughs> uh, precise strike is nice. I think I saw a Voltaic Brawl and a Servant of the Conduit as well. So I think he can play both the two drops and leave up precise strike if he wanted to. Um, but I'm uh, actually curious. Brad with the Reservoir Walker is a card that not many people like. Uh, I mean, it does generate energy. It's 5 mana 3-3. Three, three. Not impressive, but, you know, at, at least it's an artifact. Yeah, I think that it serves as a role player in a, in yeah. a number of different scenarios. Yeah, but it, you, you're usually not too happy with you if you have to run them. Um, yeah. Jeremy, even though he's on the back foot, he's still attacking. And there is Voltaic Brawler. A little bit of extra energy for Jeremy Dezani, the French former player of the year and winner of Pro Tour Theros. Yep. So I think now uh, Jeremy decided against uh, playing that servant so that he could keep a mana for the, for the array because that rhino is already annoying at, at uh, being four five. Um, Jeremy doesn't have a good way to deal with it, especially he he could have tried to stay on uh, on defense with the board and try to get a good trade in with the with the precise trade, but it's so risky. If Brad had another way to generate energy, the rhino would have grown and uh, suddenly J Jeremy's plans would be completely foiled. So. He, the, I, I like the attack and the, and the array mana um, activation. One black mana here from Brad Nelson. Let's see what he's got. Footbridge Prowler, I assume. Footbridge Prowler is a nice one, giving minus one, minus one to a creature in play. Ooh, and that's nice. Conveniently meaning that Brad gets to be very mana efficient here, spending all of his mana, getting another creature in play, such that he's able to put more counters on his team. Yeah, Rich Scale Tusker is one of my favorite cards in the set. And I actually heard some people uh, call it the best card in the set, even though it's an un uncommon. I think that's a, that's a little bit overboard, but it's definitely up there among the, among the, the best cards overall. Uh, it's just so efficient, and especially if you curve out in draft. Like, like in situations like these, like the value of a 5-mana five 5-5 five five that also puts 3 plus 1 plus 1 counters on your team. It's like a small Verger's ge Gear Hulk. Yeah, the Angry Armadillo doing the work here. And it means that Brad, N Brad Nelson able to attack in and create a spot where there's not good blocks for Jeremy Dizani. Yeah, and the, the fourth bridge power was very key in that because it made the Voltaic Brawl into a 2-1. So even with a pre precise strike, it would at best be a 3-1 first striker and not able to trade with any of the creatures after they've grown a lot. So uh, I think Jeremy is dropping fast and uh, that's the problem with, with the array. It's a great card, but if you're very much on the defense, the back foot like he is here, like having to 
be forced to deploy threats while keeping a man is tough. The trademark Jeremy Dazani head rub of, of thought there. Something that we've seen a lot in the feature match area. Cause <laughs> that's, that's kind of where he's been for the last few years. Ever since he won Pro Tour Theros, he's been very much in the spotlight. Went on to become player of the year in that year. Casts a uh, servant of the conduit, gains a little bit of energy and passes things back to Brad Nelson. Brad very much in the driver's seat at this point. And it's going to be a question of whether or not he can put away the final points as easily as he did the early ones because Jeremy Dazani back on blocks has the pacification array it's not going to be quite as straightforward for Brad to get in the last nine as it was the first 11 mm. definitely let's see if Brad has anything else up his sleeve well, he's wearing a t-shirt he's, he's going to have to reach pretty deep he's right. <laughs> he has cards and then both players are 2 and 0 oh in this pot, so I assume uh, Brad has some good stuff. Okay, Ether Poisoner. Yet more energy for the Thriving Rhino, potentially. Though at this point, the Thriving Rhino might just be sort of resigned to getting pacified turn after turn. Mm. This, is a, this is a very dangerous spot for Brad, even though he doesn't realize it now. Jeremy <laughs> trying to maybe disguise the, the one red mana. But uh, I think Brad's attacks are not that great here. I think he'll go for it, but the precise strike will do a good job of taking care of the, the Tusker by pumping the Outland Boar. And I think Jeremy will gladly trade uh, a Servant with the Fort Bridge Prowler. Yeah, precise strike, part of its potency is the fact that it's just a single mana. It makes it a little yeah. bit easier to disguise when you have a combat trick than if it costs, say, three or four. Exactly. And I, and I think this card has been performing ver very well this weekend. It's a good, very good trick. Yeah, first strike on defense yeah. is actually very, very potent indeed. You can, you can make a very one-sided set of combats. Yeah, it also helps on offense, especially against double blocks, which I think we've seen more than I expected over the last two days. So Brad knows that something must be up here. Yeah. As he knows what good card it is. Like It could I only be precise strike or shock. And despite it could be built to smash as well. Well, built to smash is only attacking creatures. Attacking creatures, creatures yeah, exactly. So. Yeah, that one that is definitely worth remembering such that you don't end up getting caught out. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of these teams in preparation for the Pro Tour have been making very careful uh, note of exactly the cost and range of combat tricks that might be available. These are the things that you need to know going into the Pro Tour so that you don't slip up. Let's see if Brad has any tricks of his own, but he just passes. He's going to see the precise strike, take down the Tusker. I like that there was the double block there from Jeremy Dazani. Mm -hmm. That his hedge against there potentially being something from Brad as well. Yeah. He needed to get the Tusker off the, off the board. Now his array can deal with uh, the Rhino. And uh, even though there's still the, the four for Reservoir Walker, that's something that he could be able to deal with eventually. I guess that the slight worry here is how much damage is he able to get through? Yes, the boar is not going to be able to be blocked by that Ether Poisoner. That's kind of a pleasant spot to be in. Voltaic Brawler here offering itself up uh, to Ether Poisoner. Yes, there'll be some trample damage coming through. But if you're Brad here, you're looking at Jeremy Dazani's life total, presumably, and saying, I don't, I don't need to do that much more, do I? Yeah. And Brad is thinking, like, oh, if I don't trade here, I can attack with the Poisoner. Like, I'll get the Servo. And remember, the Poisoner cannot block the Outland Boar because of its ability. Yeah, Outland Boar, scary for servos and indeed any other one or two power creatures out there. Yeah, this one of those games where as much as we can see lots going on on the board, there's a lot being communicated between these players yeah. in, the, in the way that they're doing their actions and they're having to consider what's in hand. Jeremy Dizani now with three cards in hand, so quite a lot of potential to have problematic follow-ups here. Yeah, there is the trade. Nelson drops to 12. Mm -hmm. Looks like another Voltaic Brawler, Appetite for the Unnatural, and yeah. a red card in hand for Jeremy Dizani. He's in great shape now. He'll be able to tap down the Rhino. I'm, I'm surprised he passed the turn before playing Appetite for the Unnatural. I think I would have played on just on my turn, because now if Brad has something like Lifecraft Cavalry, he could play it as a 6-6. Six -six. Also, there are a couple of different uh, black combat tricks that give indestructibility. Sure. Um, yeah. Though I guess that if he played one of them, then there's still the option of pacification array. But yeah. no, I see your point. 
It just fe it just felt a little, little needless. It could have been other revolt creatures. Well, you know, we've seen night market night market aeronaut as well. Uh, could be relevant uh, and so on. I would I would have just played the the appetite on on your turn. The fact that it's an instant doesn't mean that you always have to play it at instant speed. So Brad now. You can see what he's got as follow up. Um, resourceful return for on the Tusker. Doesn't draw a card, but at least get, he'll get to play a 5-5 five five and uh, make his rhino even bigger. Not that it's particularly relevant against uh, against that, that array. The angry armadillo being back, though, does mean that there's now a blocker for uh, Brad Nelson. For now. Let's see if, if this will stop Jeremy. I think he still has one more one of the Voltaic Brawls in hand, but maybe he has another boar as well. No, okay, it's the Gorger. Yeah. So Territorial Gorger coming down before Voltaic Brawler because there will be some energy gained when the Brawler comes into play. Yeah. And Territorial Gorger as a 2-2 Trampler, not super exciting, but it does not take very much in the way of energy gains for it to become a pretty potent threat. Yeah, definitely. And uh, I think Jeremy might be actually or already start thinking about how he's going to go about winning the game through attacks. Um, if he draws a creature, uh, probably not. He, he probably still can't uh, make, make huge attacks and uh, use the array aggressively on his turn to tap down blockers just because he's only on seven and he probably doesn't want to rely, rely on, uh, on a small blocker to hold the four down while he attacks. But it's still too much life for him to do that, I think. It looks like he's tapping mana for something, but uh, with one green, it's probably something like a, a tune with ether. No, it's ornamental courage. Okay, Brad's going for it. So that untaps the thriving rhino, and that means he can start smashing in. The perfect answer there to this pacification array. Jeremy Dazani shifts in his seat. This is not what he yeah. wanted to see. This is important because uh, the Rhino has at least seven power. So that means that the, the good block for Jeremy would, be, would have been double block with the Boar and the Gorger on the rich scale Tusker, but he has to block the Rhino. That was a really good draw from Brad, and you can see Jeremy is recognizing this, the untap on, on, on the or ornamental curve, doing work, and Jeremy's design is going to drop down to two from that attack. And it talked about knowing all of the tricks in the format. That the perfect trick for this situation. Yeah. <laughs> you can see when a player starts looking at your gra when your opponent starts looking at your graveyard limited, he's uh, taking uh, note of the card that you played because he's probably already preparing himself for for the next game. There's the brawler that we mentioned. So that energy does go into the energy pool. Six energy now for Jeremy Tazani. Yeah, it's still Jeremy's holding on. Uh, he can still keep tapping down the thriving rhino, and he can still double block the uh, the tusker. He's actually attacking. Wow. Does he have something else as well? This is a great game. Magic. It's really, really interesting. And I think that there are a lot of players that in Jeremy Dizani's spot might not have been attacking quite so much. And yeah. by doing this, he's giving himself an out to actually win this game rather than simply not lose. <sighs> Harness Lightning with a why. lot of energy already. Up to nine energy. And now he gets to choose what he wants to kill off. Yeah. He can kill any of the two creatures. R Rhinos has a, Rhino has eight toughness. And he probably wants to keep some energy for the Brawler. And he still has the, the Pacification area. That was, this was a bunch of haymakers, both players drawing what seemed like a perfect card for the situation in consecutive turns. Yeah, well, I, I mean, Brad Nelson now having to try and find a way of pushing through. Yeah. That was an upkeep tap of Thriving Rhino because Brad Nelson yeah. had already shown that there's wow. a trick that can get around things. And Jeremy Dazani picking up the W there. A big, big win for him in this draft. 3-0 in the first draft of the day. That's exactly what he needed. And he was on the back foot for almost the entirety of that game, but yeah. found a way of navigating through. Congratulations to him. Goes to 10-2 and two, uh, after 12 rounds. Yeah, you know what, it, what it carried, it has carried him? He was red green after two packs, and in pack three he got double voltage brawl, servant of the conduit, harness lightning, all, all the cards you need in your red green energy deck. So uh, quite fortunate for him, and he turned that into a 3-0.
Very, very good. We're going to get a chance to see a game three here between Kelvin Chu and Craig Wesco. Wesco, the first one with permanence on the board. Untamed growth and a key to the city already. So his mana is more fixed than the three forests might initially suggest. And he's got ways of making sure his creatures can go unblocked. Thriving Rhino, his first creature of the game. Mm. So key to the city dealt with handily there by Kelvin Chu. Uh, natural obsolescence, putting it on the bottom of the deck and with Welding Sparks to deal with the Thriving Rhino, Kelvin Chu fighting back very well here. He's got a red-green deck, probably not exactly like Jeremy Tizani's because Tizani <laughs> no. had so many powerful gold cards that uh, I think his deck was a little bit special, but we'll see soon enough exactly what Kel Chu does have to bring to the table. <laughs> yeah, Craig with his white cards, 3-mana three 3-2. Three yeah, I'm, I must admit, I'm not particularly in love with this one. It's, it's not one of the more powerful cards in the set. Bastion Enforcer, a 3-2 Dwarf Soldier for three. Yeah, especially when it measures up against a Treasure Keeper, which uh, is a 4 mana 3-3, but it provides so much value when it dies of uh, finding another spell. And that another artifact that would be perfect for a natural obsolescence. Yeah. Putting it on the bottom of someone's deck, far preferable to killing mm. it off in more regular fashion. Yeah, and Calvin still has plenty of cards in hand here. Craig... Uh, wants to get the trade here. It, it, this is a very interesting spot because uh, usually you would always just snap it off. If you were Kelvin Chu, immediately would block so that he can cascade into another spell uh, with that Treasure Keeper. But I think Kelvin's very um, recognizes that Craig has some revolt cards in his deck and just doesn't want to give him a free revolt trigger. He would at least try to maybe force him to sacrifice that unbridled growth, which he, Craig doesn't want to do because he's three colors and only has forests. Yeah, he's. He's mono forests, but the last two spells he played have been white thanks to that unbridled growth. Uh, Girapur Osprey, 2 2 flyer. Unlikely to be blocking here against Treasure Keeper, which is going to get in for three. Ether Chaser there for Kelvin Chu, the 2 1 first striker, bringing some energy with it and potentially a servo or two later on if Kelvin chooses to spend his energy that way. Yeah, Craig, I think he has Prey Upon and uh, the Silk Weaver Elite in his hand. Uh, yeah, at least those are two cards in his hand. Uh, I don't know what the third one is. Uh, these cards don't really line up that well here. I mean, he can use uh, the Prey Upon, but only to trade um, some of the creatures, which would then give him the, the Revolt Trigger for, for the Silk Weaver release. But he has a lot of tension in the synergy between his cards, so he has to really uh, be careful about how he expends these resources, especially because he, uh, he knows that uh, Kelvin Chu has still four cards in his hand. Yeah, plenty going on. It looks like there's a, f a few nice ones in there also. Riparian Tiger hanging out, waiting for a fifth mana. And a lot going on that could be a real problem for what Craig Wesco's got doing. Because at the moment, his creatures are just not that large. I believe there may even be an Enraged Giant in there. There's one artifact already in play. So a land would mean yeah. a big 4-4 Trample Haster next turn. Uh, Craig sacrificed the Unbridled Grove, which is very risky. Uh, if he doesn't draw his other colors of mana... But he wanted to get the card draw of the, the Elite, as well as the, the Aura itself. And now it looks like he'll prey upon the Elite with the Aether Chaser, just so he can get it off the board and swing for five. Uh, not a great turn for Cra Craig Wesco, sacrificing a lot to, to get the damage in. Yeah, he drew two extra cards that turn, but it doesn't appear on the face of things that those two cards mm. were big game changers. Three more points coming in from Kelvin Chu. Craig Wesco kind of playing a tempo game here, but he's facing down a Riparian Tiger, which can just take giant chunks out of his life total. Yeah, I mean, Kelvin Chu doesn't attack for that much damage, but he's playing really powerful cards. And uh, by also playing the Enraged Giant a little slow here, he's just threatening to uh, create a lot of trample damage out of nowhere if, uh, if Craig uh, is not careful. I think Craig drew a, a Renegade map, which is going to help him in, in the next couple of turns. It is a slow one, though. But it's very slow, yeah. Yeah, it looks like his deck didn't turn out that well. If you're forced to play the Bastion Enforcer in your three-color deck, ugh, you're not a place to be, even for lovers of White Weenie, uh, as Craig Wesco is. Worth noting, though, that Wesco is still on 9-2, uh, and two, so he's been able to pick up wins with this deck. Yeah. It's just that some of them may not have been pretty. Yeah, he probably, he probably has some bombs, uh, some bombs in his deck. Oh, look at that. Big attack from Craig Wesco into that Riparian Tiger. And Kelvin Chu is blocking. Oh, no no tricks here from Craig just there yet. There could still be Revolt, though. Yeah, there can be something going on here. Another Silk Weaver Leaf. <laughs> okay. Does he have another Prey Upon, too? 
He has an island pickup, so at least one more color available to him right away. <laughs> He's thinking. <laughs> yeah, I would love to see Craig's uh, face expression, facial expression. <laughs> I can't imagine he's looking too happy. Yeah, a motley collection of cards coming in down from Craig Wesco. Renegade map added to the board here. I think he has Fatal Push in his hand, which is really not good on this board. Uh, your opponent has a four, uh, four casting cost creature, which uh, has a very good effect. And uh, when it dies, and a, and a five mana costing cost creature, it's out of reach of the Fatal Push. And look at that, Calvin Chu. He plays Monsters Onslaught before attacking, takes care of the both two toughness creatures and gets the swing in for nine. Putting Krieg down to down to five. Krieg might have a Deadeye Harpooner. Uh, I think that, that could be the case, but it's... Oh. But um, I, I'm, it might be some other card as well. I, I really can't quite make it out. We will see soon enough. He's going to need a lot this turn. That much we yeah. know for sure. I mean, I'm, I'm starting to wonder if there's anything that, that Krieg could do here. I mean, a land into Rishkar's expertise, into sure. uh, Baral's expertise. <laughs> okay, no, but Rishkar's expertise, he wouldn't be drawing any cards. Oh, he has no true. creatures, so Baral's expertise would be would be okay. Um, but even then, I think he has a Cultivate's Caravan that he just drew. It's a good use for fixing. I think I'm going to use Rishkar's expertise into Baral's expertise as my default answer to <laughs> what could he possibly draw. That's true. It, it, we, and I, and you were joking, but we actually saw it yesterday. It was, it was a happy time. Yeah, Martin Yuza, uh was telling tales of going Rishkar's expertise, draw five, uh, play Baral's expertise for free, and then play Tezzeret for free. <laughs> Not, Not the bad. worst game. So yeah. Renegade map being popped here by Craig Wesco, fetching up a Plains the land that is his spiritual home, I'm sure. <laughs> a lover of playing white cards. Not quite the powerhouse that perhaps we were hoping for here. Cultivator's Caravan coming along. No. Oof, no. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's good that he played two cards and he's trying to stay in, in this game. But, and I'm not trying to sound too negative here, but uh, really Craig uh, is in a heap of trouble. Land coming straight into play, and it's powering out this giant. Yeah, six land, haste, trample, and a 6-6 six, six trample, and this game is over. Yeah, a 4-4 four, four trampler in the enraged giant that also, of course, has haste. Had improvised, did not use that improvised. Treasure keeper coming along, and a handshake from Craig Wesco. So big win there for Kelvin Chu. He advances to 10-2. and two. Craig Wesco dropping to 9-3 and three here at Grand Prix Prague. That the end of the very first draft. We will have a little bit more magic for you in the form of time walk matches soon enough. But first, these messages.
Hello and welcome back to this, our time walk match from round 12 of Grand Prix Prague. This is the last round of the draft for draft one here on day two of the Grand Prix. And we've got Mike Sigrist on the left of our screen up against David Mines from Australia on the right. Both these players traveled a long way to Europe for this GP is sort of part of their bigger travel toward the Pro Tour in Dublin next week. And that being, of course, Pro Tour Ether Revolt. On the left, Mike Sigrist has kicked things off with a renegade map to fix his mana and then uh, Ether Chaser in order to get creatures on the board. On the other side of things, Eddie Trail Hawk coming down for David Mines. He's got some energy, but he doesn't yet have a second color of mana. Yeah, there's a ooh, vengeful rebel on turn three with the revolt trigger. We don't see ma much many of those uh, these days, and I, I've seen we've seen Mike Sigrist's deck in the feature match in the previous round, but I, I'm starting to like it even more. I, even in the face of a solemn recruit, I, I think uh, Mike's looking fine. He, his deck has plenty of removal. The Solemn Recruit, a powerful one, 2-2 two, two double strike, and then it's, it's got its own revolt trigger that can happen turn after turn. At the beginning of your end step, if opponent you control has left the battlefield this turn, put a plus one, plus one counter on it, and a 2-2 two, two double striker does not need much help to be a potent threat. It is already an Eddy Trail Hawk in order to mean that it can fly over everything that Mike Sigrist has going on. We've found out that David Mine's second color is green. Green is the color of pump spells, Matej Zalko. Oh yeah, that... You can have some really sick combos with uh, with the Solemn Recruit um, pump spells. There's a Gonti though from from Mike, so he's gonna have a look at what uh, what David Mines is working here with. Yeah, Gonti Lord of Luxury in foil. He's gonna look at the top four cards. We get to see a little bit of them what too. Was that another Solemn Recruit, or am I dreaming? I'm not quite sure. There is a High Spire Infusion. Okay, the, the white the card. Form. It might be uh, uh, might be just the uh, um, the Ether. Uh, Ether Inspector, because the, the art can be pretty similar, but I definitely want to know. I think he would have slammed that one, I think. I, what I kind of like about Gonti is that he, he's the Lord of Tilt as well. He gets yeah. to take uh, an opponent's card. You get to see it. Your opponent does not. You've got it face down, ready to cast mm. with whatever mana you so choose. Uh, you just need to hit the converted mana cost, not the colors. Uh, so... The cards that get stolen, yeah, you can play them. I think Mike actually has a proper decision because there's a rich scale Tusker in those four cards, which would be a huge beating on this board if if he would get to cast it. But I think I think it's another Solemn Recruit. I th <laughs> I really think David Mines has two of those, so he might be thinking about just getting into the double strike. If no, he goes for the rich scale Tusker. So we're going to get a chance to see what happens when the black red decks get to play with green cards also. Yeah, now I want to look at uh, David Mines' deck list because I, I, I really want to see if he, he yeah, it was a Solemn Recruit. He has two of those. Like his white cards look so good from Ether Revolt. Double Solemn Recruit, double Top to Arrest. He also has double Airdrop Aeronauts. Rishkar Pima, Pima Renegade, not a what? bad one in green. That uh, as well? So <laughs> I missed that. His Solemn Recruit is attacking for three double strike here. So Jeez. that's kind of a problem for Mike Sigrist. There's not a great set of blocks for him here that's going to enable him to come out of this looking too rosy. Yeah, and you can see I'm not a huge fan of Eddie Trail Hawks, but if you have like two of these double strikers, like, yep, that's what you want to be doing. Lots of damage already coming through for, for David Mines here. But this limited format is great. I definitely recommend you you guys to go on hop on Magic Online to go play some because it can it can have some fun turns. Absolutely it can. Sealed deck and draft both up on Magic Online right now. And I'm sure that a lot of these pros, the very moment that they're done with this GP, that's where they're going to be, getting yeah. their testing in for the Pro Tour. <laughs> okay, Mike. Boom. Ridge Scale Tusker. When the cards in your hand simply aren't good enough, you play the cards <laughs> in your opponent's deck. Gonti <laughs> also <laughs> getting a counter. This looks like a table that's going to need quite a few dice. Yeah. And he can, Mike can uh, s swing in, at least with his Ether Chaser, but I, I think he's going to attack for, s for a couple more. And he might not even mind trading off that Rich Kill Tusker with the Solemn Recruit if he gets the chance. Yeah, the Solemn Recruit, already a 3-3 double striker, could get bigger. Yeah, swing with all, all the big creatures, leaving a servo, back, a servo back just because it doesn't match up that well against the Rich Car. David Mine just took a million damage. By million, I mean 10. Yeah, six life. He needs to be very careful of his life total here. But now if, oh, if David Mine had a land here, he could have played Dawn Feather Eagle. Attack with a 4 for Vigilant, Solemn Recruit. 
not that great against that rich skill, the rich skill test yet anyway, and he did not draw a land, but he does have a thought to arrest. There's something kind of funny to me about kind of the most impactful card that Mike Sigris has played this game has been the one that came from his opponent's deck. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. It's a four mana. Okay, Propeller Pioneer. Looks like that's the play. Fabricate, of course, meaning that there's the option of a plus one, plus one counter or a servo. Servo kind of the popular option when mm. you've got a lot of creatures beating down on the other side of things. Yeah. Uh, Mike still has plenty of cards in his hand. And uh, with David Mines on the defensive now, it, it might be hard to win if, if Mike has anything here. One good trick would be fine. I think I saw the red implement, uh, the combustion one. That's at least one more damage to the face. Sigrist. Just figuring out his plays here. One of the players that's on one of the power teams that we're expecting to see big things over out of the Pro Tour. Each of these players on nine and two, so really looking to pick up mm. a win here in order to keep their hopes of a top eight alive. Yeah, it's the finals of their draft. They both came in uh, into day two uh, at seven and two with not fantastic tiebreakers. Uh, Mike came in in 110th place. Uh, David Mine was just one spot below them, with almost identical tiebreakers. Their table looked pretty tough. Uh, it was also Andre Mengucci that we saw Mike Sigrist. Uh, uh, Mike Sigrist defeated him in one of the previous rounds. After this game, of course, or after this match, should I say, we will have another draft going on here in Prague. We're going to get a chance to bring you one draft live and hopefully another ma another draft uh, in sort of replay mode. So if you want to get a feel for how these sorts of decks come together, we can see pick by pick mm. what these players are taking um, before, of course, three more rounds to get us into our top eight. Indeed. And that's going to be exciting. Uh, a lot of really good players on, at the top tables. Actually, before this round, I talked to Paolo Vitor Damodrosa. He's still undefeated, 10-1. and one. And We'll see how this round panned out, but he's in great shape as well. And here's an attack from Mike. Just Tusker, Gonti, and the Ether Chaser swinging in. Not, a, not an all-out attack, but should be pretty good value here. Yeah, definitely enough that David Mines needs to give pause that solemn recruit has double strike so depending on how he blocked he was potentially going to be able to kill something off just with first strike but elects for a different line here in order to get the big tusker off the battlefield yeah. it's a decent play he's going to David Mine's going to drop, uh, drop down to three but only the trade of creatures one side and David Mines loses that, that servo token and so, look at that, the board, four creatures against two, and Mike still has plenty of cards in his hand. I'm pretty sure if he had, didn't have a trick to finish off the game right away, he has to have some creatures to follow this up with. I mean, if he'd found the extra land for his, um, his eagle, he may have been able to get something going here, but it looks like it may be too little too late in this game for David Mines. Mines, of course, was on the Australian team that went very deep in the World Magic Cup uh, just at the end of last year. And has been putting in solid performances in the Pro Tour for the last sort of year or so. Yeah, that's uh, another way to finish off a game. And Nightmark, uh, Nightmark the Aeronaut uh, is a 3 3 flyer, problematic to block. And I think David Mines will have seen enough after, after he draws his card, unless he has a land and Fumiga. I, I just think he drew a second uh, top to arrest. Yeah, servo schematic there, just sort of icing on the cake from Mike Sigaris. That enough for David Mines to scoop up his cards. We're going to be going to a game two here. And of course, by the wonders of uh, Turbo Magic, <laughs> we get to skip all that shuffling and go straight into the games. That's the real magic. Yeah, exactly. A one drop in the red implement there from Mike Sigrist. Uh, one of the more efficient implements out there. It doesn't do as much as some of, the, say, the black implement or the blue one, but simply getting a one-cost artifact in play, pretty relevant if you have any improvise going yeah. on. Yeah, and also my, I really like the way Mike actually built his deck because he has a uh, also has a raven ravenous intruder in his hand, and we've seen it him put it quite a good, good use with the servo schematic with the implement of combustion. It's kind of cute that with the intruder, you kind of generate an extra damage and you save a mana because you just sacrifice the implement to, to the intruder. And you still draw a card. Yeah, exactly. 
through to the Cal coming down for David Mines. That a solid blocker against the uh, thriving rats that came from Mike Sigrist. Though in this case, it's tapping out to help him cast a propeller pioneer return early. And that pioneer with Fabricate becoming a 3-2 flyer rather than just the regular 2-1. Yeah, the, the rats are swinging. I was surprised Mike did not play the, the intruder because it, it uh, matches up a little better against the druid. Uh, it, it, because it can grow to three power compared to right, rats, which are only two power. But uh, Mike just goes for a cruel finality here to take care of the pioneer. He gets the sky on top after everything else there. Yeah. Solemn recruit, and uh, yeah, <laughs> and David just uh, <laughs> <laughs> it makes up his mana you, because you know what David was trying to do. David Mines actually he plays two alley evasions, so he was actually trying to keep up a white source to protect the solemn recruit from uh, from anything that could kill it. And uh, but he <laughs> probably forgot that the, the druid only generates green mana. Yep, that's not gonna fly. Instead, just gets stuck in for a point of damage with the um, druid of the cowl instead. Thriving Rats returning the favor, getting in for two, and here we see the sacrifice of that implement. So now we get a chance to see what Mike Sigrist is gonna do with the Ooh, Revolt Trigger. Vengeful Rebel. Ouch, minus three, minus three, thanks to the Revolt Trigger. You know, implement again, showing off how good it is. And when you've got something like Vengeful Rebel in your deck, you really do need ways of triggering a uh, revolt. <laughs> there we see the second Solemn Recruit. It's, it's a very solemn place for David Mines right now, but he's, his, his recruitment drive is going excellently. Oh, yeah, definitely. But again, he doesn't have the third white source to protect it. And uh, last turn, the LD Evasion would have actually helped, uh, helped the Solemn Recruit to, su to survive. And now he again, he, I see also High Spark Infusion. So uh, we, we know what's up with, uh, with David Mines' deck, but it, it seems like he's always on the back foot with Mike having quite a bit of removal in his deck. Yeah, David Mines almost wants to be a combo deck with those Solemn Recruits, yeah. attacking in for a crazy amount of double strike damage in one go. Thus far, Mike Sigrist is doing a good job of keeping him off that. Looks like he's got a weapon, and craft in weapon craft enthusiast in the front of his hand. That generates a lot of servos for potential improvisation purposes. Yeah, but it looks like Mike is out, out of removal, uh, which bodes well for David Mines here. It's, it looks like uh, Mike will just try to play a, a creature and maybe um, like the Alley Strangle, maybe the Implement of Combustion. I also had a Nightmare Micrid Aeronaut, which I assume he's going to try to save for later when he can trigger a Vault on it. The Strangler, there's the Implement, yeah. So two Implements of Combustion thus far seen from Mike Sigrist. These are such interesting cards to me because they did look a little bit lackluster when I first saw them within the, the card previews, but they turn out to be potent in a wide variety of decks. Here Salt. comes the recruit, yeah. Is, does he have the kill yet? He, he gives plus three, plus three from the high spire infusion and the LE vision. So he can make it a six power creature, which is 12 damage. This just the kind of block that's going to get some kind of a trick out of mm. David Mines. Yep. So that's going to be LE evasion, plus one, plus two. One of my favorite tricks in this format. I, just, I, I, love, I love it in that it's over style and it also can help you trigger revolt if you need it. I mean, any trick that costs one is immediately yeah. pretty close to the top of the list. Yeah, I mean, there's the audacious infiltrator from uh, from David Mines here. Uh, one of the two he has. Three one for two that can't be blocked by artifact creatures. Not too much of a worry yet, but we know there's a weapon cross enthusiast in Mike Sigrist's hand. Mm. Yeah, I like I, I like the infiltrator. It's it's not a particularly spectacular creature, but if you get played early, you can chip in for some damage, and it's it's a great. Uh, uh, it's a great pilot for uh, for vehicles with that three power. Sigrist the game up, looking to put this one away here, trying to figure out how he's going to get around that solemn recruit. He kind of has to respect that it could represent a lot of damage. Mm. Unlike Sigrist, David Mines has yet to really do too much with Revolt. Mm. Absolutely. There's the Wentful, Wentful Rebel swinging. Let's see, I think Mike, like, he's probably scared of the Solemn Recruit, but he, I don't think, 
I think that he thinks that uh, David Mines uh, can probably not kill him in one turn just yet. David Mines also doesn't have that much mana. So maybe he can let through the Solemn Recruit him for at least once. And uh, Mike can maybe develop his board with uh, sacrificing the implement and playing the Night Market Aeronaut. And uh, that could also uh, help him dig for the Noxious Gear Hulk, which we saw already help him win a couple of games before. Noxious Gear Hulk certainly changes the face of games. Yeah. I think he drew a mobile garrison, though. That's the one. I don't think that's going to change the plan too terribly no. much. Wants to get the revolt on. 3-3 three, three Flyer is certainly a potent threat, and it means that even if the ground gets a bit shored up and Solemn Recruit is a great blocker on top of everything else, there's still a consistent source of damage now for Siggy. And he uses his mana very efficiently over the turns. Uh, we tend to forget that this is basically only turn uh, five. Both players playing very heavily on curve. Okay, an airdrop aeronauts from David Mines. Four, three flyer, no revolt trigger, but still very solid. I mean, ultimately, I feel like the big difference in this game is that Mike Sigrist has successfully triggered all of his result revolt. David Mines has yet to trigger a revolt in any way. Yeah. And... If it were the other way around, I'm pretty sure that we'd be saying that David Mines was winning. Probably, yeah. Ether Revolt, the clue's in the name. <laughs> and it's it, not just Ether. Yeah, of course. But but that's the thing. Uh, Mike's deck is built to take care, advantage of it a little bit more. The the red implements are really good. Uh, in that regard, it, it, it's so cheap and does so much more. Whereas David Mines, we haven't seen a, an implement of Ferocity yet, for example, which is another one of those. Uh, that really worked nicely in, in, in green-white decks. Uh, he actually just has no implements whatsoever. And, uh, but the card power level is pretty high. I mean, double Solemn Recruit, double Thopter Arrest. It's great. And double uh, Airdrop Aeronauts. Big swings here and the menace that uh, Mike Sigris is presenting, meaning there's not really any good blocks for David Mines here. Mm. Yeah, I mean, David could have double blocked, right? But he would have lost the Solemn Recruit. Which he, he just not, which he doesn't want to happen. So right now, I feel like if David Mines is winning this game, he's doing it with a flurry of spells or nothing at all. Yeah, pretty much. Which is an exciting place to be in terms <laughs> of a game of Magic. I'm certainly happier knowing that there's a chance. So you're saying there's a chance. Okay, so Mobile Garrison and the Ra Ravenous Intruder. Not the most impressive creature on this board, just because there's he's out of artifacts for now. But his board is very wide. David Mines trying to piece it together. He's got that eagle once more, but yeah, he just drew Dawn it. Feather Eagle costs five. He only he's gonna have to tap the Druid of the Cal to get there. Yep. At least I mean, it's not that bad, but it still doesn't really present him with that many good attacks. The Solemn Recruit, the, its problem is that it's even as a 3-3 three, three double striker, it just dies to do, it just trades with the Mobile Garrison. Uh, so that's not great. So I think David Mines is going to attack with the Airdrop Aeronauts as a 5-4 as a flyer. And the Audacious Infiltrator by the looks of things also. It can't be blocked Probably by yeah. artifact creatures. It's going to at least trade with something. Yeah. And by something, it's, uh, the only option is basically Wenchful Re Rebel or uh, uh, because I don't think Mike will want to sacrifice the mobile garrison for the Ra Ravenous Intruder. So just here, just figuring out his best blocks. Complicated turn for both players here. And David Mines being only on six is actually quite problematic depending on what Mike Sigrist uh, draws here. Because Mike's board is very wide. Still the point where Sigrist just figuring out exactly how he wants to block here. Does elect to trade off with the Audacious Infiltrator. 
Yep. And we roll the trigger, finally. David Mines got there. Will it be too little too late? We'll find out soon enough. Uh, Mike Sigris with a pretty formidable looking board here. But the one plus one plus one counter on the, the recruit actually can change so much. Um, it, it, it can now block the Alex Triangle, for example. Uh, oh, the, his aeronauts can always uh, block, well, can bounce off of each other and, and both die in the air. I would love to see that in live action, you know, Night Market <laughs> Aeronaut against Airdrop Aeronauts. Would be pretty cool. Like, let's see if Gonti can find something good. One, two, three, four cards off the top of David Mine's deck. Mike Sigris gets to pick the one that he likes the best. One, two, three. Is that four lands? I think it's three lands and one spell, right? But he doesn't want to give too much away. Or is it? No, no, it was four lands, right? A full four lands. Yeah. yeah he's at least trying to hide it. Mike's not going to be happy about that. Makes it that much more likely that David Mine's going to draw a spell here. He doesn't want to give him. Yeah, not the greatest Gonti of all time, but the only reason it's not more luxurious is because David Mine's deck is not delivering. For either player this game, but the Rich Skill Task in game one was brutal. David Mine's, though, has to be super duper. Like, if he knew. Yeah, if he knew. He, would, he, would be, he would be doing laps of the table with how that, go that Gonti yeah, went. Yeah, but he, that's the problem. He doesn't, doesn't know. That's the, that's the beauty of Gonti that uh, David Mines doesn't know. And now he can be scared, actually, of his own cards. He knows what's in his deck, so he might be scared that uh, Mike Sigrist uh, got some, some sort of instant there or even a, a very, really good creature. I mean, David Mines has two top three rests in his deck and uh, uh, hasn't drawn one just yet. So David Mines might be thinking, oh, man, uh, uh, Sigurd maybe ha it's very likely that he has a top two rest on, on the on the table there, and if I don't do much about it, I, I can just lose the following turn. So Mobile Garrison coming in here, Conti briefly getting tapped, but then untapped again by it, and there we see the trade. David Mind doing what he can just to keep that life total up where he can. All right, big draw now for David Mines. What's the spell? I but think it was another Aerodrop Aeronauts. There is a high Spire Infusion in hand for David Mines here, so 3-3 three, three double strike at present could turn into a 6-6 six, six double strike. Yeah. Technically speaking, uh, yeah. David Mines can present lethal here. Yeah, if he attacks and if Mike Sigurds doesn't block, which is unlikely to happen now, I think Mike, Mike is going to be quite wary of uh, just throwing uh, the game here, and he has to be suspicious. Like, why is he attacking with the Solemn Recruit? Why would he do that? Yeah, this, this feels like the kind of attack where there's very little downside in mm. throwing a guy in front of it. Yeah. Whereas the alternative, if you don't block, is potentially fatal. So, post-combat, what does David Mines have? Five mana. There are the aeronauts. No revolt trigger once again. Just an ether chaser, I think, for, for Mike. He also has the weapon craft enthusiast, which is actually pretty nice because uh, it can create a lot of blockers for the Solemn recruit. Yeah, this might be a turn where Sigurd is tempted to play multiple cards. The tricky bit for him is that his avenues of attack are narrowing. Yeah, definitely. We see the other pump fake. This is one where Sigurus definitely needs to figure out his sequencing, make sure that he is able to deploy his threats in an efficient fashion. Already a game up. This would be a heartbreaker to lose. A very tense game. It doesn't seem so uh, on the surface, but it, uh, it is actually very, very close and tense. Weapon craft enthusiast does come down, brings a couple of servos with it, so... Sigurd's board good and wide now. Ooh, and he's swinging. Well, all of a sudden, those gremlins, they've got some food as well. Uh, so they, they do represent five damage on their own now. So Sigurd comes in with 
pretty much his team here. Yeah, and there's now suddenly, because uh, David Mine was uh, starting to get aggressive, they, like the drop, he draw, uh, the draw, uh, the blocks he's lining up. Sorry about that. It don't look that good here. Um, Mike can always just sac start sacrificing servos um, to have the intruder survive. He can also just try to go for the trade. Right, but I assume he will go for with a double sacrifice. Yep. Make it into a 5 6. Flyers trade off. This triggers as well. And uh, Dave Nice took two still from the Gaunty. Remember that? That was unblocked. There's an Ether Chaser as well. Couple of energy. That could potentially create more servos. Yep. I think it was a th top to arrest for, for David Mines, though. Not a good start. He does need to push through damage, but he needs to watch out for his life total. Four means that potentially a single creature mm. could be enough with a little bit of support from Mike Sigrist here. Yeah, he can't. I don't think David can attack here again. I think he has a Skyweller shot as well, but now he has no targets for it. That that will be left stranded in his hand until Mike plays a plays a creature with power three or more. Yeah, David Mines kind of would like to get an extra land at some point here. Four is a little bit tight, even with the Druid of the Cal. He can't really afford to be tapping the Druid of the Cal. There is Thopter Arrest, takes out Gonti, Lord of Luxury. If the Thopter Arrest goes away, which admittedly is pretty tough for a black yeah. red deck to achieve, uh, then Gonti will trigger again. Hmm. What David Mines doesn't know is that the card that's face down, stolen by Gonti, in this case, is a non-starter, it's a forest. Yeah. And uh, I think it will, it will take a couple of turns, uh, like probably not now, but uh, David Mines will figure out eventually that it's, it's just nothing. Because if it was a spell, Mike Sigrid would play it here, right? There, it's very likely that he would at least. And uh, if it's a creature, he would also play it, play it here. So it's just, he'll figure out that it's very likely that it's just the land. Well, he already knows it can't be a pump spell because yeah. he would almost certainly be dead if that were the yes, case. Yes, exactly. Uh, it's unlikely to be a creature, and that's basically David Mines' yeah. deck. Even if it was like something like a vehicle or some sort of equipment, yeah, Mike's, <laughs> Mike's just checking out, oh, okay, what is it again? Okay. He could have tried to at least like um, uh, pretend to read it, like, uh, what does it do again? Yeah, Hollywooding, it's, it's <laughs> yeah. like the Oscar performances on these, you need to get the tone just right to, to keep that, that bluff alive. Mm. And unfortunately, it's a bluff where he knows that Mi David Mines knows a lot more about what that card could be than he, in fact, does. Uh, that's not the <laughs> Ouch. So he uh, mistakenly uh, revealed that Skywalker was shot because he thought it was an Eddie Trailhawk. Eddie Trailhawk, kind of an interesting one here because yeah. it does mean that there's the potential for that Solemn it's Recruit to come in in the air. It's actually lethal because uh, if David Mines actually uh, goes, for, uh, goes for it, uh, the game's over. I don't think that David Mines is in a position where he can do anything but go for it. He's. I mean, he can. The, the board's pretty, uh, pretty set. I mean, there's not much Mike can do in, on, in the attacking sense, and uh, because I think on the other hand, David Mines has to think like, okay, if he has a removal for my solemn recruit, I I would be dead anyway, so might as well go for it, I, because he doesn't want to give Mike more windows to draw a removal spell. Yeah, challenging spot here. This is a real test of nerve for David Mines. If I'm Mike Sigrist here, I really want to be looking at that yeah. face down card on the on the battlefield just yeah, once sure. more. Well, Mines says to the air we go. <laughs> High spire infusion. Yep. Man, game three, there we go. David Mines does it. He looks at the card. Oh, it was just a forest. Haha. <laughs> All right. So we now know the path to victory for David Mines in this deck. We, we pretty much called it. It was going to be the big flurry. It didn't need to be that many spells, as it turns out. Solemn Recruit can do it fairly straightforwardly. And we are on to game three here. Looks like there's a mulligan from Mike Sigrist. Not what you want when you're on the play in game three with your red-black deck. Yeah, with David Mines on... Uh on seven cards, you know, he he is, has a bit of a combo deck of sorts, but overall, like his his white cards from uh, Ether Revolt uh, are very good. He must be he must have been really well positioned uh, at the table, and he also we also saw that Rich Skeleton Tusker, the the Rish car, 
his deck seems very good. Yeah, big thanks to the guys in the chat that have corrected me on the exact nature of the uh, creature type on um, the Tusker. It's not, in fact, a um, an armadillo. It's a pangolin, apparently. Okay, what's the, di what's the difference? Spelling. Spelling? Okay. <laughs> they look about the same, right? Th there's a similarity there. I can believe that they're distant cousins. All right, let's see what Mike can, uh, can work, work with here. I see a thriving rat. I, I, think I, I see lands and spells. Yeah, that's, uh, that's and for good. a six-card hand, that's kind of where I want to yeah. be. Sounds good to me. Thriving rats on turn two. Mm. Seems like a fine start. He has a daredevil dragster as well. I can uh, get him some cards and some damage. Ooh. Druid of the Cowl, a nice blocker here for yeah. the rats. Still a pretty strong temptation to get that counter on there. It's a much <laughs> more exciting creature as a 2-3 than it is as a... One two, definitely, and I, I don't think Mike has that many ways to use the energy, so the ether chaser. And with two power, it's much better at crewing vehicles. We already know that there's a, a mobile garrison somewhere in Mike Sigrist's deck. In this case, though, Oval Chase Dragster. This is kind of an interesting Dare, one. Daredevil Dragster. Ah, uh, sorry, yes. The, the Oval Chase one is the the the, the other one. So this one's also interesting. It's a three mana four four. Uh, vehicle with crew two, I think. Yes. Uh, at the end of combat, if you attack or block, you put a counter on it. And if it has two counters, you have to sacrifice and draw two cards. So in a way, it's good uh, that you know you can hit for some damage, draw some cards. Sometimes you do lose a lot of board presence uh, by having to sacrifice it, but you can somewhat control when, when that's going to be hap but that is going to happen. Uh, Fairgrounds trumpets are coming down for David Mines. We know that there's a few cards in his deck that. Will uh, synergize very very well with the trumpeter mm. if we if we get to see a Rishkar in this game for example oh, yeah. that elephant is going to be out of control yeah I'm pretty neat with the uh, with the solemn recruit as well I don't know if it if actually if you can stack it that way hmm. I'll, I'll have to uh, I'll, I'll look up the cards to check but first of all lost to counter going there on the uh, dragster gets mm. a hit in for four with the rats but the wheel like rats in a wheel yeah, I would love to see that again in live action. <laughs> see, uh, the rats behind the wheel, and especially in the dragster, <laughs> it would be pretty fun. Okay, there's a cruel f finality. Yeah, that's enough to deal with the elephant before it potentially gets bigger. And a land drop. Mike Sigrist, despite being on a mulligan here, looking in great shape. Yeah, he, he's fine. But a again, as I mentioned with the dragster, it's a little deceptive because next turn Mike can uh, crew the dragster attack. He'll sack the draw two cards, but he'll suddenly lose the presence of that vehicle, and he'll he'll have to follow it up with something very good. And we know that David Mines has uh, 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 some strong five drops. Uh, about we know about the aeronauts, um, the four three fire that is, and the rich skill tusker as well. I think he also has propeller pioneer in his hand, but he's just going to go for the big guy right away. There's the pangolin putting a counter on Drew to the cowl. It's now a two four, and in just in and of itself, a five five monster a big deal yeah and I don't think Mike actually has that many ways to deal with the, with big creatures um, yeah ideally you'd want to be leaning on black removal that can just mm. unconditionally kill creatures yeah. but I I don't know that there's that much in Mike's deck let's, yeah. let's he see he actually has hand. a tidy conclusion in his hand but he doesn't have the fifth land so that that is the big problem yeah so here it's a, a bit of a tough spot for Sigrist he, if he attacks with his uh, dragster it does need to be a round at the end of combat in order to get sacrifice to draw cards, so yep. it, that would be a, a futile attack. So it's, it's all going to come down to what he can do with the cards in his hand right now, otherwise we might be seeing a pass on turn four. Indeed, and uh, I think he has some other cards. He doesn't have the fifth land, so he should be able to cast something. Question is, on what, it, what it, is it going to be? I think I saw Vengeful Rebel, which is uh, the minus three, minus three effect, which it's not that good of a trade. He could try to go in with the Dragster, uh, put four damage on the Tuscan and fish it, finish it off. But he would then uh, default on the two cards from the Dragster. Uh, it probably wouldn't be great. But if he thinks he has a good follow-up, he might just go for it. Now, if you're David Mines here... Oh, just with the rats. Uh, that, was a, that was a good uh, um, decline on the block on the David Mines' side. Because he, he did, sm did see the rebel before and he, he smelled it in the air. This is an implement of malice. And Sigrist considering popping it straight away. Yeah. Four, good car four cards in uh, David Mines' hand. 
Yeah, high spare infusion, good value, and there's the fifth line from Mike Sigrist. So he plays it, gets it ready for next turn. Yep. Shields down a little bit for Mike Sigrist here if David Mines wants to get stuck in. And it looks like he absolutely does get five points of damage on the board. Mike Sigrist dropping to 15 on this attack. The follow up play looks to be a propeller pioneer here coming along with a token. That looks fine to me. Eddie Trehog also solid. But right. I think Mike can now uh, get some value from the dragster, get some cards going. It is going to die no matter what. So that will give him maybe a card for Vengeful Rebel. Maybe he can go for the tidy conclusion on the on the Tusker. We'll yeah, see. the attack here is a little safer because he can potentially get extra value. If there's a weird multiple block, then he can break that up with tidy conclusion. I don't think it's likely from David Mines here, but you never know. Yeah. And extra cards, you know, hard to argue with them. I just don't you just love uh, drawing extra cards? It, it feels like cheating because if you do it without a good reason, it is cheating. <laughs> yeah, the quick shout out to our chat for uh, helping me imagine on how actually the rats would be driving the dragster. Apparently they love it. They're thriving. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I, I, I can imagine the, the rats with their small helmets, you know, just really enjoying it's the like ride. It's like a dream for them. Yes, yeah. it's, it's literally as as they're going to bed in their little ratty beds at night. They go, <laughs> "What do you want to do tomorrow?" <laughs> no, I, I can just imagine a tiny little rat and going like, "Oh, what do you want to be when you when you grow up? I want to be a driver. I want to be a pilot. You can do that, buddy. You can do that." And we're gonna see it right now. Yeah, there we go. In the dragster, in they come. Just the chump block, right? So post combat, there goes the dragster. Crash. One, two. Oh, ooh, ooh, incendiary sabotage. I like it. I do. Oh no yeah, no artifacts in play anymore, but I'm sure that's something that Mike Sigrist can fix if he so chooses. Yeah, I mean, I think I saw an implement in his hand, but it doesn't deal with the Tusker just yet. Uh, th that's the main issue, I think. So I think he, he, he should just go for, for the tidy conclusion. Because no. that 5-5 that five five is the, the biggest problem on the board. I guess that the biggest reason to play it now rather than wait until David Mines' turn is that there is an alley evasion which could bounce it, which would be a bit of a disaster for yeah. Mike Sigrist. Oh, yeah. Just because it's an instant doesn't mean you have to play it at that point. I guess there's also options around Vengeful Rebel here, making the most of the fact that you've had a card go to the graveyard from play this turn. Yeah, there is a tidy conclusion, as expected. No life gain for Mike, but at least he gets rid of a, bi a big uh, guy from the board. And now... Mike, if he actually has that, if that is an implement in his hand and he has that incendiary sabotage, um, that deals three to each cre each creature. If David Mines like slams uh, maybe the airdrop aeronauts, like he does, Mike can get some insane value out of it. Yeah, Druid of the Cal has four toughness, but I don't think that Mike Sigrist is going to mind too much if he's managing to get uh, three creatures dealt with on the other side of the battlefield. Those, and he also those just thriving drew an rats might He just drew an Oxus Gearhulk. He doesn't have the six mana just yet, but if he can set it up with the with an incendiary sabotage, it's going to be insane. I mean, it, it almost always is. Yeah, I mean, of course. I, uh, there's one card I would like to have. It's, it's Noxious Gearhulk. I think it's one of the best cards. Yeah, and the reason it's one of the best cards is that Obviously, if you're ahead, it's great. Mm. But if you're behind, it gets you right back in the game. Oh, yeah. Killing off your opponent's best creature, gaining you some life. It's got menace. Mm. It's a big body. It's, it's a very powerful card. Uh, Mike's just attacking. David Mines not biting because he knows about the revolt threat. And he's going to have to play it a little slow here because the Implement of Malice does cost two. Oh, it's okay. It's actually a servo schematic. All right. Yeah, this this one a little awkward in terms of if you're sacrificing an artifact for it, you, you might just sacrifice the servo here because even though normally servo schematic yeah. loves being sacrificed, you'd only make a token that would immediately die. Yeah. But I, I think David Ma uh, Mike might be forced to block. Well, he probably can't block any any of them if uh, if David Mike decides to uh, give Druid of the Cow flying. It's uh, it's a lot of damage. It's nine. Yeah, nine damage. Mike going to one. No pump spells from David Mines. True that the cow hanging around might yet prove a problem. Yeah. 
Actually, it looks like it will be. Audacious this. More fodder for the audacious infiltrator. Uh, uh, for that incendiary sabotage, but the Druid of the Cow might be enough to win that game. There's the Noxious Gear Hulk. Yeah, the Gear Hulk on its own, not necessarily the play here. Mike Sigrist. This is the finals of the draft that he's in against David Miner. Just to let you know, this is a video recap match, so right after this one, we're hoping to be able to jump into showing you another draft here from Grand Prix Prague. Yeah, Mike, Mike Sigurd seems a little defeated here already. He just slammed him out because he knows uh, it's not working out the way he wanted it to. And he's just going to pass the turn here. Yeah, he wants to be able to block through to the cow before uh, casting incendiary sabotage. Yeah, it is an instant, but uh, that's flying, so he can give it flying. Yeah, and he just like shows. And there's the handshake. So Mike Sigurds actually managed to lose this one to David Mines, who's now at 10 and 2. Wow. Congratulations Tenth. to the Australian David Mines there. Going into the second draft of the day here at Grand Prix Prague, still in with a hope and a prayer of making it into the top eight. That is the last of our magic here from round 12. Soon enough, we'll have our drafts for you before round 13. But first, these messages.